Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again today, and thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us every day at the same time, or every week, I'm sorry, at the same time. And I trust that this series has been a blessing to you. We've been talking about Ezra and Nehemiah, and we have been doing a series called Roadmap to Reformation. It's a pretty much inexhaustible study. I've really gotten uh, some things in, out of this myself personally by studying it, and I'm going to continue to be a student myself as I uh, dig in this powerful revelation that I believe God has been speaking to my heart. Today we're going to start talking about the 12 gates of Nehemiah. Before I do that, let me remind you, though, that we have already aired a number of programs on Ezra, Nehemiah, and the Roadmap to Reformation. You can go back and review those by simply going to our YouTube channel. You can also get the audio portions at uh, our, our podcast, and uh, you can get the audio at an RSS feed for your Android device. The easiest way to do that is to go to our website at www.lynnhiles.com. That's on the screen right there. And up in the upper right hand corner there is icons there that will take, has a direct link to those. I, I encourage you to subscribe to them. Uh, they are free of charge. I, I especially encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch these on demand on any kind of a streaming device. I'm really thankful for that platform because it's really reaching around the globe. Um, and so while you're there, if you'd like, while you're there at our website, if you'd like to sow a seed into our ministry, let me just tell you that it really does take an immense amount of money to produce television on this level and to, to offer it for free. And so your partnership is vital to us. And if you would like to give, you can, of course, give uh, via a check or money order uh, at the address that will come up at the end of the program. But when you go to my website to log on to any of these, there's a place where you can simply give via PayPal, and you can use your credit card or debit card there to give. And you can, if you'd like to, set up a monthly debit where you can become a partner. We do need your partnership. Enough said about that. I want to go and, and talk to, to you, though. We've been talking about how uh, Ezra and Nehemiah came back from Babylonian captivity. And they were uh, instructed by God to begin to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city, which is Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, we see a striking resemblance because in chapters, it's probably somewhere around through 17 through the first part of chapter 20, it's talking a great, about the great harlot Babylon. And then immediately upon the judgment of the great harlot, he says, Hallelujah, now has come salvation and the kingdom of our God and His bride has made herself ready. And then you see the chapters following that immediately begin to talk about the new Jerusalem. We showed you in prior segments a lot about this, so I'm not going to review too much except a springboard from this and tell you that uh, you know, when, when, you, when you see these things, we, we, what, what this is is a tale of two cities. And I showed you in prior segments how Galatians chapter number 4 talks about these two women are two covenants. And the Jerusalem, which now is, that's the natural seed. He tells you very clearly if you read it in the Amplified Bible, Galatians chapter 4, that the Jerusalem, which now is, is Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's old covenant Hagar, and is in bondage with her children. But the messianic kingdom of God, those of us who are born by virtue of supernatural birth, are Isaac, in whom the seed has been called. That's the new covenant. Old covenant Jerusalem, new covenant Jerusalem, and he tells you that those that are a part of the messianic kingdom of Christ are part of the new Jerusalem that is continuing to come down from God out of heaven. The city of God in Revelation 21 and 22 is not a place, it is a people. It is the bride, the Lamb's wife. It is the tabernacle of God that is with men. It is the restored tabernacle and the restored city 
that Ezra and Nehemiah were only a type and shadow of. God talks to us in pictures because it gives us a language to be able to understand uh, what He's saying to us. I don't have to, I don't want to, I really don't want to review too much, but Revelation 3, I believe it is verse 12 says, to him who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go no more out. Now, him making us a pillar in the temple of our God is, is, is uh, hyperbole, or literally it is a symbol. He's telling you, I'm going to make you a pillar. In other words, he's not just going to stand you up and pour concrete over you. So if you're the pillar in the temple of God, by the time you get to Revelation, he's not talking about a physical geographical location. He goes on to say, I will uh, make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven And so he's telling you very clearly there in Revelation that the overcomer is the tabernacle and the holy, and and that the overcomer is the city of the living God. Uh, Hebrews 11, Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I'm sorry, yeah, um, yeah, chapter 11, he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. But in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, you did not come to Mount Sinai, that's Old Covenant. He said, but you have come to Mount Zion and you have come to the city of the living God. So uh, the old covenant had no continuing city. The new covenant, the city of God is not a place, it's a people. And so uh, that city of God is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being chief cornerstone. We're going to get into a lot of details about this, but I'm not going to get in a rush because we have a lot of people who are viewing these at least in their, sometimes in their midweek services or in private Bible studies or just in, we have some schools that are using some of our material for this. So I'm not going to get in a rush to talk about it. And I think sometimes it's good to review because most people go to the book of Revelation with a very literal uh, mindset. But if you have any kind of spiritual discernment at all, it doesn't take you long to realize he's talking in hyperbole and signs and symbols and uh, all kinds of, of imagery that is interpreted by looking at the Old Testament, which was the shadow, and the New Covenant is the substance. So we can see clearly that the Lamb in the book of Revelation is not a barnyard creature. It's talking about Jesus, because we read the book of Exodus. So we're going to talk about the city of God, because it's mentioned in other places as being the New Covenant community of faith. And so you know what, we're going to talk about a few things uh, here in ab- about this city in uh, several of the next, se- se- probably several weeks we're going to be talking about the 12 gates of the city because uh, Revelation chapter 21 tells us that, that, uh, uh, if, that you can have a right to enter in through the gates into the city of God. Let me just see if I can find it real quickly. I marked it here. It says in, uh, in verse number uh, Uh, 17 of Revelation 21. I probably shouldn't have jumped in right here, but I will. Then he measured its wall. It was 144 cubits. That's incredible to me. Even I'm not going to talk about the wall much yet at this point because, but Ezra and Nehemiah reestablished and built the walls. But the walls measured 144 cubits. Now that's not an accident to me that that's multiples of 12, but it's also the number of the overcomer in the book of Revelation. And there was 144,000 that were sealed that in my opinion is not a literal number, but a number that signifies and declares the overcomers. So the wall was 144 cubits according to the measurement of a man, that is of an angel, and the construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, clear, like clear glass. One of the things that that would say to me if it was pure gold, gold is symbolizing in the Scriptures divine nature, His divine nature, purity, gold. And it was clear as glass, or clear as a crystal, the King James Bible says. What that tells me is two things. Number one, there's no mixture in it. It's transparent. And and, and, and there's no mixture in it. The second thing it says to me, if it's clear as a crystal, it can be right in your midst and you can't see it. 
And so if you don't have a spiritual eye, you're not going to see this, this city of God. Listen, the things of the Spirit are not given to the carnal mind. And I'm afraid that we've been so carnally minded in the church, we've missed a lot of powerful truth that God is trying to say to us by looking at it through the lens of the natural mind. He goes on to say, the foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all, with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth uh, sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh was jasper, and the twelfth was amethyst. And this is the verse I'm after. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now we're not going to get into uh, the typology of this, but I want to skip down also to verse 25. It said, its gates, this is very important, shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and, the, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, but there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now let me just, let me, I'll come back and talk about this city quite a bit, but I want to talk about this, the gates uh, specifically more because we're going to look at the gates of Nehemiah, the twelve gates. These 12 gates were made of one several pearl. Now immediately when I think about typology and the scriptures, once again I've showed you how I hope if you've watched our videos at all you start to see how we interpret the scriptures through using other scriptures. We use the Bible to interpret the Bible, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things not comparing spiritual things with USA Today or CNN or any other news outlet. We are comparing these things because they are normally mentioned someplace else in the Bible. So when I start thinking about, again, the city, I look at, in the restoration of the city, I look at Ezra, Nehemiah, and some of these books of the Bible. Isaiah prophesied quite a bit about the restored New Jerusalem where Messiah would be king. He's not talking about a physical location, he's talking about him being king over his church, his bride, the Lamb's wife, the tabernacle of God that we are, that's built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being chief cornerstone. Now we know that if that's spiritual, this is a spiritual city. The foundation was apostolic, the apostles laid the foundation. Jesus was chief cornerstone. He's also the capstone. I think we saw in a prior segment uh, that Zechariah said that this building he would lay not only, I believe it was Zerubbabel would not only lay the cornerstone, but he would lay the capstone and that they would do it by shouting grace, grace to it. We find that in the Gospel of John that Jesus said, Moses gave you the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And he said, starts talking about we were not under the law, but we have received grace upon grace, grace for grace. So it's uh, shouting grace, grace. The new covenant temple of God, the new covenant city of God is built upon that kind of a foundation. But each one of these gates is of one several pearl. Now when I start to think about a pearl, immediately my mind goes to a parable that Jesus talked about. He said, when a man knows that there's a pearl of great price that's hid in a field, he will sell all he has to go buy that fee. I am excited to announce the release of my newest book titled The Great I Am. In this book we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. Every time he uses that phrase it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought that the bread that fell in the wilderness was the true bread, but Jesus says to them, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead, but I am the true bread. They thought Moses and the law was the door to the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. As you read the pages of this book, you will truly discover the faith that replaces fear and that believing you will have life through his name you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. You will rediscover that He is the great I Am. 
Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today. Because he finds it to be worth something. He also, uh, you know, uh, talks about that, uh, the value of that and finding value. Uh, you, you know, uh, a pearl comes from a grain of sand getting inside of an oyster and irritating it until its suffering begins to secrete a deposit that creates a pearl stone. Now let me just talk about symbolism here. The pearl of great price is your salvation, and your salvation was obtained through the suffering of Jesus Christ who took on the sand of our human existence and suffered to the point where He regenerated and began to make us new that through His suffering and through His redemptive work we could become a pearl of great price. Now let me just say first of all that the pearl of great price to me speaks of the price that Jesus was willing to pay in order to redeem us, to give us access into the city of God, into the kingdom of God, and into the uh, 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 to have access. See, when you enter the city of God, you have access to a tree of life, not a tree of death, but a tree of life. You have, if you enter into the city, you have access to a river of water of life that flows freely, that will cause the weeping and the tears to be wiped off of all faces according to Gen or Gen Revelation chapter 21. That's not just talking about when you die one day, he's talking about wiping the tears from your eyes by realizing the veil has been, and the, the shroud of death that was over us, which was the old covenant mentality, the veil of the old covenant that was full of curses would bring you into the new covenant city of God where the curse has been reversed and there is no curse in this city. That was obtained through the suffering of Jesus to give us access into this city, this city of peace. One of the things that I wanted to put in this, and I'm going to do it in this segment, is it is called Jerusalem. Let me, let me quickly take you back here and show you something in the book of Hebrews, because Hebrews, the seventh chapter, talks about the city and the priesthood that, that is functioning in the city. Uh, Hebrews, the seventh chapter, said, for this Melchizedek is king of Salem. He's the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priesthood continually. Now what I want you to see is this city of God has a new covenant priest, not Levi, that's old covenant. It has Melchizedek. Melchizedek brings forth bread and wine. The symbolism here is so powerful to me that I could just literally start preaching. But all Melchizedek did was he served bread and wine. That's the covenant meal. That's the same thing Jesus served the night before his decease when he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Uh, do this in remembrance of me. And this cup is my blood of the new covenant which was poured out for you. And I think Jesus was excited even though that it was the night before his decease because he knows that he's anxious to eat this. He said, with great desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you. And he begins to say to them that I desire this because I think he knows, well, I don't think, I know he knows that this is the last woolly lamb they'll ever have to kill and the last Passover physical feast they will ever have to have because what he's saying to them is, I am the ultimate lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what he did through his blood was inaugurated a new covenant. This blood is my blood in the, of the new covenant. Uh, that is poured out for you. And so Melchizedek is a picture of the priesthood of Jesus Christ of which we 
as priests and kings, uh, Peter said, for you're a chosen generation, you're a royal priesthood. We become part of a Melchizedek priesthood order, not serving up the same old fear and the same old law, the same old uh, curse and rules of Levi, or the same old rituals of circumcision and all of the keeping of the rituals and the co- uh, 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 or the observances of the old covenant, but we operate in a brand new covenant after the order of Melchizedek. And we uh, serve bread and wine, and uh, he was by interpretation. I'll, I'll come back and say a few more things in just a moment, but I want to get this before I forget it. He was called the king of righteousness, and also he is that the name Melchizedek means the king of righteousness, and he was the king of Salem. Salem uh, being peace, or literally Jerusalem, the city of peace. So in this teaching concerning the gates of the city, don't miss this point, I'm going to try to review it quite a bit, but in the teaching of the gates of this city, you are either going into the city or you are coming out of it, moving away from it. If you are headed into the city, you are headed into peace. If you are leaving the city, you are leaving peace. There's a lot of people that need peace today. He's the king of peace. You have access through the gate of pearl, which was his suffering, to enter into his peace and enter into his righteousness. So you're either moving into his righteousness or you're moving away from his righteousness because outside the city are dogs and whoremongers and whoever loves and makes a lie. And we'll we'll look at some of these things but the gates are never shut. You have access by grace through faith into this peace and into this righteousness. We're in the new covenant. Righteousness is not based on works. It's based on the free gift of God that we receive the gift of righteousness. It says because of the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, we reign in life by one Christ Jesus. And so, you know, the, the, the reigning in life by one Christ Jesus is something that we, we need to understand is ours through, uh, you know, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, as we look at the redemptive work of Christ, then we, we can walk away from some of the stuff that's troubling us. We can move away from the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth that's an outer darkness, that doesn't mean you went to hell, it just means you have not really moved into the revelation of the light of the life of this city that is available right now. As I think about Melchizedek, again, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, the the terminology or the name of God that is used here, Most High God, is El Elyon, and it is translated as El Elyon, but it's translated all through the King James Bible as the Most High God. Psalm 91 said, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. This name of God is associated with the Most Holy Place. It is associated with the mercy seat. This kingdom has a mercy seat. He's not bringing you, as you approach and come into the city, you're approaching a blood-sprinkled mercy seat where there is forgiveness of sin as you enter in through the gate of available. But Jesus said in, in the gospel, I am the door into the sheepfold. I'm the I'm the only way in. We're going to talk about that door a little bit more when we get to the sheep gate. But he said, I'm the door. In other words, the only access into this mercy, into this righteousness, into this grace, and into this peace is through the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice of his suffering that gives you access to the tree of life and to the water of life and to the street. Not streets, one street. There's only one street in this city, and it's a pure gold, which just speaks again of divine nature. If I can just be a little bit presumptuous, I think it's a street called straight. It's a highway called holiness, and it's not where you drive a car. It's speaking about the walk that you walk once you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when I think about Melchizedek, I think about the mercy seat. I think about he's the priest of the Most High God. The Scriptures call Jesus the Son of the Highest. 
He was, uh, gl- uh, he was the son of the most high God. Daniel, I believe it is chapter 7, said there's only one kind of saint that's going to take the kingdom, and that's going to be the saints of the Most High God. It's a people who understand that He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, that's the most holy place. There's three dimensions in the tabernacle, an outer court, a holy place, and a most holy place. The third dimension, the most holy place, is a cube. It's a square. It is 10 by 10 by 10 measured in the tabernacle of Moses, but when we get to Revelation, the book of Revelation, this city is four square. It is a square. It is a cube. If I can say this, I believe it's speaking of a people who are dwelling and living in the most holy place. So you have access into this peace. You have access into this righteousness. You have access to this mercy seat by the blood of Jesus. Perhaps you're watching me today and you're thinking, you know, I really could use some peace. I I really could use a change in my life. Let me tell you that this book declares, Revelation 21 said, her gates are never shut. The last couple verses of Revelation 22 says, the spirit and the bride say, come. So if you can hear it today, there is an invitation that's coming from the most holy place. There's an invitation coming from the spirit of God to you today that says the gates are open. Enter into the gates. Don't remain in the confusion of the world. Don't stay in Babylon. Don't remain captive and a slave to a system of religion, or don't become a captive or a slave to substance abuse or to some sin that is literally robbing you of your peace. It is robbing you of your righteousness. It is robbing you of your joy. Melchizedek is on the scene, and he wants to offer you that. All you've got to do is receive him into your heart and say, I want to enter into the gates. Just pray with me for a moment. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to receive your peace. I want to receive your gift of righteousness. I want to receive your mercy. Let me enter into that gate that I can drink the water of life without cost to me, in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, I believe that something transpired in your life. We're about to run out of time today on this first segment, but if you'd like to watch, continue to watch us every week at the same time, if you'd like to sow a seed into the ministry, you can do that by calling the number that comes up on the screen. Someone will take your credit card or your your, your, uh, debit card. There's also, uh, you can send a check or money order to the address that'll come up on the screen, or you can just go to the website and give. God bless you and thank you for tuning in. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.